Book One of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Shadow and Bone. Chapter 16. Bagra's relief was unmistakable, but she wasted no time. You can slip out with the performers tonight, head west. When you get to Oscurvo, find the Valoran. It's a Kurch traitor. Your passage has been paid. My fingers froze on the buttons of my kefta. You want me to go to West Ravka to cross the fold alone? I want you to disappear, girl. You're strong enough to travel the fold on your own now. It should be easy work. Why do you think I've spent so much time training you? Another thing I hadn't bothered to question. The Darkling had told Bagra to leave me be. I thought he was just defending me, but maybe he just wanted to keep me weak. I shucked off the kefta and pulled a rough wool tunic over my head. You knew what he intended all along. Why tell me now? I asked her. Why tonight? We've run out of time. I never truly believed he'd find Morozova's herd. They're elusive creatures, part of the oldest science, the making at the heart of the world. But I underestimated his men. No, I thought as I yanked on leather breeches and boots. You underestimated Mal. Mal, who could hunt and track like no other. Mal, who could make rabbits out of rocks. Mal, who would find the stag and deliver me, deliver us all, into the Darkling's power without ever knowing it. Bagra passed me a thick brown traveling coat lined in fur, a heavy fur hat, and a broad belt. As I looped it around my waist, I found a money bag attached to it, along with my knife and a pouch that held my leather gloves, the mirrors tucked safely inside. She led me out a small door and handed me a leather traveling pack that I slung across my shoulders. She pointed across the grounds to where the lights from the Grand Palace flickered in the distance. I could hear music playing. With a start, I realized that the party was still in full swing. It seemed like years had passed since I'd left the ballroom, but it couldn't have been much more than an hour. Go to the hedge maze and turn left. Stay off the lighted paths. Some of the entertainers are already leaving. Find one of the departing wagons. They're only searched on their way into the palace, so you should be safe. Should be? Bagra ignored me. When you get out of Ozolta, try to avoid the main roads. She handed me a sealed envelope. You're a serf woodworker on your way to West Ravka to meet your new master. Do you understand? Yes, I nodded, my heart already starting to race in my chest. Why are you helping me? I asked suddenly. Why would you betray your own son? For a moment, she stood straight-backed and silent in the shadow of the little palace. Then she turned to me, and I took a startled step back, because I saw it, as clearly as if I had been standing on its edge. The abyss, ceaseless, black, and yawning, the unending emptiness of a life lived too long. All those years ago, she said softly, before he'd ever dreamed of a second army, before he gave up his name and became the Darkling. He was just a brilliant, talented boy. I gave him his ambition. I gave him his pride. When the time came, I should have been the one to stop him. She smiled then, a small smile of such aching sadness that it was hard to look at. You think I don't love my son, she said, but I do. It is because I love him that I will not let him put himself beyond redemption. She glanced back at the little palace. I will post a servant at your door tomorrow morning to claim that you are ill. I'll try to buy you as much time as I can. I bit my lip. Tonight. You'll have to post the servant tonight. The Darkling might... might come to my room. I expected Bagra to laugh at me again, but instead she just shook her head and said softly, Foolish girl. Her contempt would have been much easier to bear. Looking out at the grounds, I thought of what lay ahead of me. Was I really going to do this? I had to choke back my panic. Thank you, Bagra, I gulped. For everything. Humph, she said. Now go, girl. Be quick and take care. I turned my back on her and ran. Endless days of training with Bakken meant I knew the grounds well. I was grateful for every sweaty hour as I jogged over lawns and between trees. Bagra sent thin coils of blackness to either side of me, cloaking me in the darkness as I drew closer to the back of the Grand Palace. Were Marie and Nadia still dancing inside? Was Jenny wondering where I'd gone? I shoved those thoughts away from my mind. I was afraid to think too hard about what I was doing, about everything I was leaving behind. A theatrical troupe was loading up a wagon with props and racks of costumes, their driver already gripping the reins and shouting at them to hurry things along. One of them climbed up beside him, and the others crowded into the little pony cart that departed with a jingle of bells. I darted into the back of the wagon and wiggled my way between pieces of scenery, covering myself with a burlap drop cloth. As we rumbled down the long gravel drive and through the palace gates, I held my breath. I was sure that, at any moment, someone would raise the alarm and we would be stopped. I would be pulled from the back of the wagon in disgrace. But then the wheels jounced forward and we were rattling over the cobblestone streets of Ozolta. I tried to remember the route that I had taken with the Darkling when he had brought me through the city those many months ago. 
but I had been so tired and overwhelmed that my memory was a useless blur of mansions and misty streets. I couldn't see much from my hiding place, and I didn't dare peek out. With my luck, someone would be passing at just that instant and catch sight of me. My only hope was to put as much distance as possible between myself and the palace before my absence was noticed. I didn't know how long Bagra would be able to stall, and I willed the wagon's driver to move faster. When we crossed over the bridge and into the market town, I allowed myself a tiny sigh of relief. Cold air crept through the cart's wooden slats, and I was grateful for the thick coat Bagra had provided. I was weary and uncomfortable, but mostly I was just frightened. I was running from the most powerful man in Ravka. The Grisha, the first army, maybe even Mal and his trackers would be unleashed to find me. What chance did I have of making it to the fold on my own? And if I did make it to West Ravka and onto the Valoran, then what? I would be alone in a strange land where I didn't speak the language and I knew no one. Tears stung my eyes and I brushed them furiously away. If I started crying, I didn't think I'd be able to stop. We traveled through the early hours of the morning, past the stone streets of Azalta, and onto the wide dirt swath of the Vi. Dawn came and went. Occasionally I dozed, but my fear and discomfort kept me awake for most of the ride. When the sun was high in the sky and I'd begun to sweat in my thick coat, the wagon rolled to a stop. I risked taking a peek over the side of the cart. We were behind what looked like a tavern or an inn. I stretched out my legs. Both of my feet had fallen asleep, and I winced as the blood rushed painfully back to my toes. I waited until the driver and the other members of the troop had gone inside before I slid out from my hiding place. I figured I would attract more attention if I looked like I was sneaking around, so I stood up straight and walked briskly around the building, joining the bustle of carts and people on the village's main street. It took a little eavesdropping, but I soon realized I was in Balakarev. It was a little town almost directly west of Azalta. I'd gotten lucky. I was headed in the right direction. During the ride, I'd counted the money Bagra had given me and tried to make a plan. I knew the fastest way to travel would be on horseback, but I also knew that a girl on her own with enough coin to buy a mount would attract attention. What I really needed to do was steal a horse, but I had no idea how to go about that, so I decided to just keep moving. On the way out of town, I stopped at a market stall to buy a supply of hard cheese, bread, and dried meat. Hungry, are you? asked the toothless old vendor, looking at me a little too closely as I shoved the food into my pack. My brother is. He eats like a pig, I said, and pretended to wave at someone in the crowd. Coming, I shouted and hurried off. All I could hope was that he would remember a girl traveling with her family or, better yet, that he wouldn't remember me at all. I spent that night sleeping in the tidy hayloft of a dairy farm just off the Vi. It was a long way from my beautiful bed at the little palace, but I was grateful for the shelter and for the sound of animals around me. The soft lowing and rustle of the cows made me feel less alone as I curled on my side, using my pack and my fur hat as a makeshift pillow. What if Bagra was wrong? I worried as I lay there. What if she'd lied? Or what if she was just mistaken? I could go back to the little palace. I could sleep in my own bed and take my lessons with Bodkin and chat with Jinya. It was such a tempting thought. If I went back, would the Darkling forgive me? Forgive me? What was wrong with me? He was the one who wanted to put a collar around my neck and make me a slave, and I was fretting over his forgiveness? I rolled onto my other side, furious with myself. In my heart, I knew that Bagra was right. I remembered my own words to Mal. He owns us all. I'd said it angrily, without thinking, because I'd wanted to hurt Mal's pride, but I'd spoken the truth just as surely as Bagra. I knew the Darkling was ruthless and dangerous, but I'd ignored all that, happy to believe in my supposedly great destiny, thrilled to think that I was the one he wanted. Why don't you just admit that you wanted to belong to him, said a voice in my head. Why don't you admit that part of you still does? I thrust the thought away. I tried to think of what the next day might bring, of what might be the safest route west. I tried to think of anything but the storm cloud color of his eyes. I let myself spend the next day and night traveling on the Vi, blending in with the traffic that came and went on the way to Azalta. But I knew that Bagra stalling would only buy me so much time, and the main roads were just too risky. From then on, I kept to the woods and fields, using hunters' trails and farm tracks. It was slow going on foot. My legs ached and I had blisters on the tops of my toes, but I made myself keep heading west, following the trajectory of the sun in the sky. At night, I pulled my fur hat low over my ears and huddled shivering in my coat, listening to my belly grumble and making myself picture maps in my head, the maps I had worked on so long ago in the comfort of the document's tent. I pictured my own slow progress from Azalta to Balakarev, skirting the little villages of Chernitsyn, Kirsky, and Polvost, and tried not to give up hope. I had a long way to go to the fold, but all I could do was keep moving and hope that my luck held. You're still alive, I whispered to myself in the dark. 
you're still free. Occasionally I encountered farmers or other travelers. I wore my gloves and kept my hand on my knife in case of trouble, but they took little notice of me. I was constantly hungry. I had always been a rotten hunter, so I subsisted on the meager supplies I bought back in Balakarev, on water from streams and on the occasional egg or apple stolen from a lonely farm. I had no idea what the future held or what waited for me at the end of this grueling journey, and yet, somehow, I wasn't miserable. I'd been lonely my whole life, but I'd never been truly alone before, and it wasn't nearly as scary as I'd imagined. All the same, when I came upon a tiny whitewashed church one morning, I couldn't resist slipping inside to hear the priest say Mass. When he finished, he offered prayers for the congregation, for a woman's son who had been wounded in battle, for an infant who was ill with fever, and for the health of Alina Starkov. I flinched. Let the saints protect the sun summoner, intoned the priest, she who was sent to deliver us from the evils of the shadow fold and make this nation whole again. I swallowed hard and ducked quickly out of the church. They pray for you now, I thought bleakly, but if the darkling has his way, they'll come to hate you. And maybe they should. Wasn't I abandoning Ravka and all the people who believed in me? Only my power could destroy the fold, and I was running away. I shook my head. I couldn't afford to think about any of that right now. I was a traitor and a fugitive. Once I was free of the darkling, I could worry about Ravka's future. I set a fast pace up the trail and into the woods, chased up the hillside by the ringing of church bells. As I pictured the map in my head, I realized I would soon reach Rivost, and that meant making a decision about the best way to reach the Shadowfold. I could follow the river route or head into the Petrozoi, the stony mountains that loomed to the northwest. The river would be easier going, but it would mean passing through the heavily populated areas. The mountains were a more direct route, but it would be much tougher to traverse. I debated with myself until I came to the crossroads at Shura, then chose the mountain route. I would have to stop in Rivos before I headed into the foothills. It was the largest of the river cities, and I knew I was taking a risk, but I also knew that I wouldn't make it through the Petrozoi without more food and some kind of tent or bedroll. After so many days on my own, the noise and bustle of Rivos' crowded streets and canals felt strange to me. I kept my head down and my hat pulled low, sure that I would find posters of my face on every lamppost and shop window. But the deeper I got into the city, the more I began to relax. Maybe word of my disappearance hadn't spread as far or as fast as I had expected. My mouth watered at the smells of roasting lamb and fresh bread, and I treated myself to an apple as I refreshed my supplies of hard cheese and dried meat. I was tying my new bedroll to my traveling pack and trying to figure out how I was going to lug all the extra weight up the mountainside when I rounded a corner and nearly ran right into a group of soldiers. My heart slammed into a gallop at the sight of their long olive coats and the rifles on their backs. I wanted to turn on my heel and sprint in the opposite direction, but I kept my head low and forced myself to keep walking at a normal pace. Once I'd passed them, I risked a glance back. They weren't looking after me suspiciously. In fact, they didn't seem to be doing much of anything. They were talking and joking, one of them catcalling at a girl hanging out the wash. I stepped into a side street and waited for my heartbeat to return to normal. What was going on? I'd escaped from the little palace well over a week ago. The alarm must have been raised by now. I'd been sure the Darkling would send riders to every regiment in every town. Every member of the 1st and 2nd Army should be looking for me by now. As I headed out of Rivost, I saw other soldiers. Some were on leave, others on duty, but none of them seemed to be looking at me. I didn't know what to make of it. I wondered if I had Bagra to thank. Maybe she'd managed to convince the Darkling that I'd been kidnapped or even killed by Fjordans. Or maybe he just thought that I'd already made it farther west. I decided not to press my luck and hurried to find my way out of town. It took me longer than I'd expected, and I didn't reach the western outskirts of the city until well past nightfall. The streets were dark and empty except for a few disreputable-looking taverns and an old drunk leaning up against a building, singing softly to himself. As I hurried past a noisy inn, the door flew open and a heavy-set man toppled out onto the street on a burst of light and music. He grabbed hold of my coat and pulled me close. Hello, pretty. Have you come to keep me warm? I tried to pull away. You're strong for such a little thing. I could smell the stink of stale beer on his hot breath. Let go of me, I said in a low voice. Don't be like that, Lapushka, he crooned. We could have fun, you and me. I said let go of me. I pushed against his chest. Not for a bit yet, he chuckled, pulling me into the shadows of the alley beside the tavern. I want to show you something. I flicked my wrist and felt the comforting weight of the mirror slide between my fingers. My hand shot out and light flared into his eyes in a single quick flash. He grunted as the light blinded him, throwing his hands up and letting go of me. I did as Bakken had instructed. 
I stomped down hard on the arch of his foot and then hooked my leg behind his ankle. His legs flew out from under him and he hit the ground with a thud. At that moment, the side door to the tavern flew open. A uniformed soldier emerged, a bottle of Kavaz in one hand and a scantily clad woman clutched in the other. With a wave of dread, I saw that he was dressed in the charcoal uniform of the Darkling's guard. His bleary glance took in the scene. A man on the ground and me standing over him. What's all this? He slurred. The girl on his arm tittered. I'm blind, wailed the man on the ground. She blinded me. The Alpritchnik looked at me and then peered at me. His eyes met mine and recognition spread across his face. My luck had run out. Even if no one else was looking for me, the Darkling's guards were. You, he whispered. I ran. I bolted down an alleyway and into a maze of narrow streets, my heart pounding in my chest. As soon as I cleared the last few dingy buildings of Rivost, I hurtled off the road and into the underbrush. Branches stung my cheeks and forehead as I stumbled deeper into the woods. Behind me rose the sounds of pursuit. Men shouting to one another, heavy footfalls through the wood. I wanted to run blindly, but I made myself stop and listen. They were to the east of me, searching near the road. I couldn't tell how many there were. I quieted my breathing and I realized I could hear rushing water. There must be a stream nearby, a tributary of the river. If I could make it to the water, I could hide my tracks and they would be hard-pressed to find me in the darkness. I made for the sounds of the stream, stopping periodically to correct my course. I struggled up a hill so steep I was almost crawling, pulling myself up by branches and exposed tree roots. There, the voice called out from below me, and looking over my shoulder, I saw lights moving through the woods toward the base of the hill. I clawed my way higher, the earth slipping beneath my hands, each breath burning in my lungs. When I got to the top, I dragged myself over the edge and looked down. I felt a surge of hope as I spotted moonlight glimmering off of the surface of the stream. I slid down the steep hill, leaning back to try to keep my balance, moving as fast as I dared. I heard shouts, and when I looked behind me, I saw the shapes of my pursuers silhouetted against the night sky. They had reached the top of the hill. Panic got the best of me, and I started to run down the slope, sending showers of pebbles clattering down the hills of the stream below. The grade was too steep. I lost my footing and fell forward, scraping both hands as I hit the ground hard and, unable to stop my momentum, somersaulted down the hill and plunged into the freezing water. For a moment, I thought my heart had stopped. The cold was like a hand, gripping my body in a relentless, icy grip as I tumbled through the water. Then my head broke the surface and I gasped, drawing in precious air before the current grabbed me and pulled me under again. I don't know how far the water took me. All I thought about was my next breath and the growing numbness in my limbs. Finally, when I thought I couldn't fight my way to the surface again, the current drove me into a slow, silent pool. I grabbed hold of a rock and pulled myself into the shallows, dragging myself to my feet, my boots slipping on the smooth river stones as I stumbled under the weight of my sodden coat. I don't know how I did it, but I pushed my way into the woods and burrowed under a thick copse of bushes before I let myself collapse, shivering in the cold and still coughing river water. It was easily the worst night of my life. My coat was soaked through. My feet were numb in my boots. I started at any sound, sure that I'd been found. My fur hat, my pack full of food, and my new bedroll had all been lost somewhere upstream, so my disastrous excursion into Rivos had been for nothing. My money pouch was gone. At least my knife was still safely sheathed at my hip. Somewhere near dawn, I let myself summon a little sunlight to dry my boots and warm my clammy hands. I dozed and dreamed of Bagra holding my own knife to my throat, her laugh a dry rattle in my ear. I awoke to the pounding of my heart and the sounds of movement in the woods around me. I had fallen asleep slumped against the base of a tree, hidden, I hoped, behind the copse of bushes. From where I sat, I could see no one, but I could hear voices in the distance. I hesitated, frozen in place, unsure of what to do. If I moved, I risked giving away my position, but if I stayed silent, it would only be a matter of time before they found me. My heart began to race as the sounds grew closer. Through the leaves, I glimpsed a stocky, bearded soldier. He had a rifle in his hands, but I knew there was no chance that they would kill me. I was too valuable. It gave me an advantage if I was willing to die. They're not going to take me. The thought came to me with sure and sudden clarity. I won't go back. I flicked my wrist and a mirror slid into my left hand. With my other hand, I pulled out my knife, feeling the weight of gracious steel in my palm. Silently, I drew myself into a crouch and waited, listening. I was frightened, but I was surprised to find that some part of me felt eager. I watched the bearded soldier through the leaves, circling closer until he was just feet from me. I could see a bead of sweat trickling down his neck, the morning light gleaming off his rifle barrel, and for a moment I thought he might be looking right at me. A call sounded from deep in the woods. The soldier shouted back to them. Nichevo! Nothing. 
and then, to my amazement, he turned and walked away from me. I listened as the sounds faded, the voices growing more distant, the footfalls more faint. Could I possibly be so lucky? Had they somehow mistaken an animal's trail or another traveler's for mine? Or was it some kind of trick? I waited, my body trembling, until all I could hear was the relative quiet of the wood, the calls of insects and birds, the rustle of the wind in the trees. At last, I slid the mirror back into my glove and took a deep, shuddering breath. I returned my knife to its sheath and slowly rose out of my crouch. I reached for my still damp coat lying in a crumpled heat on the ground and froze at the unmistakable sound of a soft step behind me. I spun on my heel, my heart in my throat, and saw a figure partially hidden by branches, only a few feet from me. I'd been so focused on the bearded soldier that I hadn't realized there was someone behind me. In an instant, the knife was back in my hand, the mirror held high as the figure emerged silently from the trees. I stared, sure I must be hallucinating. Mal. I opened my mouth to speak, but he put his finger to his lips in warning, his gaze locked on mine. He waited a moment, listening, then gestured to me to follow and melted back into the woods. I grabbed my coat and hurried after him, doing my best to keep up. It was no easy task. He moved silently, slipping like a shadow through the branches, as if he could see paths invisible to others' eyes. He led me back to the stream, to a shallow bend where we were able to slog across. I cringed as the icy water poured back into my boots again. When we emerged on the other side, he circled back to cover our tracks. I was bursting with questions, and my mind kept jumping from one thought to the next. How had Mal found me? Had he been tracking me with the other soldiers? What did it mean that he was helping me? I wanted to reach out and touch him to make sure he was real. I wanted to throw my arms around him in gratitude. I wanted to punch him in the eye for the things he'd said to me that night at the little palace. We walked for hours in complete silence. Periodically, he would gesture for me to stop, and I would wait as he disappeared into the underbrush to hide our tracks. Sometime in the afternoon, we began climbing a rocky path. I wasn't sure where the stream had spit me out, but I felt fairly certain that he must have been leading me into the Petrozoi. Each step was agony. My boots were still wet and fresh blisters formed on my heels and toes. My miserable night in the woods had left me with a pounding headache and I was dizzy from lack of food, but I wasn't about to complain. I kept quiet as he led me up the mountain and then off the trail, scrabbling over rocks until my legs were shaking with fatigue and my throat burned with thirst. When Mal finally stopped, we were high up the mountain hidden from view by an enormous outcropping of rock and a few scraggly pines. Here, he said, dropping his pack. He slid sure-footed back down the mountain, and I knew he was going to try to cover the traces of my clumsy progress over the rocks. Gratefully, I sank to the ground and closed my eyes. My feet were throbbing, but I was worried that if I took my boots off, I would never get them back on again. My head drooped, but I couldn't let myself sleep. Not yet. I had a thousand questions, but only one couldn't wait until morning. Dusk was falling by the time Mal returned, moving silently over the terrain. He sat down across from me and pulled a canteen from his pack. After taking a swig, he swiped his hand over his mouth and passed the water to me. I drank deeply. Slow down, he said. That has to last us through tomorrow. Sorry. I handed the canteen back to him. We can't risk a fire tonight, he said, gazing out into the gathering dark. Maybe tomorrow. I nodded. My coat had dried during our trek up the mountain, though the sleeves were still a little damp. I felt rumpled, dirty, and cold. Mostly, I was just reeling over the miracle that was sitting in front of me. That would have to wait. I was terrified of the answer, but I had to ask. Mal, I waited for him to look at me. Did you find the herd? Did you capture Moritz over a stag? He tapped his hand on his knee. Why is it so important? It's a long story. I need to know. Does he have the stag? No. They're close, though? He nodded. But... But what? Mal hesitated. In the remnants of the afternoon light, I saw a ghost of the cocky smile I knew so well playing on his lips. I don't think they'll find it without me. I raised my eyebrows. Because you're just that good? No, he said, serious again. Maybe. Don't get me wrong, they're good trackers, the best in the First Army. But you have to have a feel for tracking the herd. They aren't ordinary animals. And you're no ordinary tracker, I thought, but didn't say. I watched him, thinking of what the Darkling had once said about not understanding our own gifts. Could there be more to Mal's talent than just luck or practice? He certainly never suffered from a lack of confidence, but I didn't think that this was about conceit. I hope you're right, I murmured. Now you answer a question for me, he said, and there was a harsh edge to his voice. Why did you run? For the first time, I realized that Mal had no idea why I'd fled the little palace. 
why the darkling was searching for me. The last time I'd seen him, I'd essentially ordered him out of my sight. But still, he'd left everything behind and come for me. He deserved an explanation, but I had no idea where to begin. I sighed and rubbed a hand over my face. What had I gotten us into? If I told you that I'm trying to save the world, would you believe me? He stared at me, his eyes hard. So this isn't some kind of lover's quarrel where you turn around and go running back to him? No, I exclaimed in shock. It's not, we're not. I was at a loss for words and then I just had to laugh. I wish it were something like that. Mal was quiet for a long time. Then, as if he'd reached some kind of decision, he said, All right. He stood up, stretched, and slung his rifle over his shoulder. Then he drew a thick wool blanket from his pack and tossed it to me. Get some rest, he said. I'll take the first watch. He turned his back on me, looking out at the moon rising high over the valley we had left behind. I curled up on the hard ground, pulling the blanket tight around me for warmth. Despite my discomfort, my eyelids felt heavy and I could feel exhaustion dragging me under. Mal, I whispered into the night. What? Thanks for finding me. I wasn't sure if I was dreaming, but somewhere in the dark, I thought I heard him whisper, always. I let sleep take me.